Okay, good afternoon. Um, can you hear me? I can. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Miguel Fernandez. I am the director of the Latin American and Caribbean programs for NatureServe. And I want to welcome all of you to this new edition of our webinar, Pulse of the Planet. This is an initiative led by NatureServe and supported by the Geobond Secretariat and EcoHealth Alliance. The goal is to spread the word and share the scientific activities of the members of the network. The NatureServe network is made up of 87 members um, and organizations from Patagonia to Alaska. And we're working together on different projects, including climate change, invasive species, ecosystem services, citizen science, land degradation, and restoration. If you're based in the Latin America and the Caribbean region, being a member of our network doesn't cost uh, anything. Our network is open and our main objective is to facilitate uh, projects, regional projects that have to do with global change. If your organization is, is interested in participating in this communication network, please do not hesitate and contact me. Today, we have a slightly different version of this webinar because this time, as part of a collaboration with the Ecosystem Restoration Global Initiatives in Science and Practice, organized by the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group of the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management, we have invited Dr. Leticia Navarro to give us a talk. Dr. Navarro is the current Executive Secretary of Geobon, a global biodiversity monitoring network based in Leipzig, Germany, to which NatureServe belongs. She's the co-author of books, book chapters, and several articles in high-impact scientific journals on the topic of ecosystem restoration. She's also co-author of the latest IPBS thematic evaluation on ecosystem degradation and restoration. Without further delay, it is an honor and a pleasure today to be able to give the floor to Leticia. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you, Miguel, and uh, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. I'll start by turning off uh, my camera. Um, and I wanted to thank you again. I lost apologies. I stopped sharing screen instead of stopping the camera. Just give me a second, sorry about that. While we fix this technical yeah. detail, <laughs> sorry, uh, let yeah. me tell you that if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to write them on the question uh, window on, on, on your control panel for go to webinar. Uh, or you could, um, at the end of the presentation, you could raise your hand and I'll give you the, the uh, I'll unmute you so you could actually ask your question. Thank you so much. We're almost back. I just froze completely uh, PowerPoint and I just had to restart my presentation. No but it's worries. loading. <laughs> And of course, in those situations, it takes forever to load. Mm -hmm. Okay, the progress bar is almost there. So, I will share now my screen. Um, please let me know if it's working. It's working. Um, we can see the, the comments page, though. You can see the comments. This is not what I want. I'm really sorry. No problem. You can still picture. see the, the comments yep. sharing. Uh, we have prepared for this. It's, a, it's a up in the corner, Leticia. Now, uh, I got it. Yeah, now it right. should be fine. Okay, so yeah, apologies for this. Uh, and 
Thank you uh, again for this uh, invitation to this Pulse of the Planet webinar where I'll discuss uh, ecosystem restoration in the conservation agenda and opportunities uh, for rewilding as one uh, restoration approach. And so I've chosen to organize this presentation uh, into three segments. The first one will be dedicated to uh, addressing land degradation. I will then discuss uh, ecosystem restoration per se. And finally, I'll move on to the third topic uh, of this talk, which is something that I've uh, dedicated a lot of my uh, research to, and which is rewilding. But first, um, let's address land degradation. And as some of you may know, about a year ago in Medellin, Colombia, uh, the plenary of IPES, which is the Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, approved its second uh, thematic assessment. And this assessment had started three years before and involved about 100 of experts, including Miguel and myself, and it was dedicated to land degradation and restoration. So we're talking about a document of several hundreds of pages, and here I'm just briefly going to walk you through uh, their key messages. And the first key message is that land degradation is a pervasive systemic phenomenon that occurs in all parts of the terrestrial world and that can take many forms. And this is what is illustrated to some extent in the figure below, which shows you uh, different estimates of the proportion of land that is either assessed as degraded or assessed as being affected by human pressure. So in this figure, the yellow bars show you how much is affected or degraded. Uh, and the green bars show you the proportion of the terrestrial area that is covered by the ecosystem of interest. So concretely, uh, if you look at the top uh, bar in the histogram, you can see that about a third of wetlands are estimated to have been lost uh, in the past 40 years, while half of the grasslands and over two thirds of the forest are considered to be degraded globally. And overall, uh, about 75% of the terrestrial ice-free surface, um, land surface, sorry, is considered to be affected uh, by human activities. The second key message uh, of this IPES assessment was that urgent and concerted action need to be taken. Otherwise, uh, land degradation is likely to worsen due to uh, population growth, consumption patterns, a globalized economy, as well as climate change. And to illustrate this point, I chose a study that was published earlier this month by some of my colleagues. And what they did here is that they used uh, data on global trade, so on exports and imports, and they were able to attribute uh, land use change to this international trade, and then to attribute uh, the biodiversity impact. So here it was uh, measured as the loss of bird species. Um, so the biodiversity impact that would result from the land use change. And with this type of approach, what you can do is identify within a country or within a region how much species are lost due to the production of goods, so what you can see here uh, on the left-hand side, and how much uh, is lost due to the consumption of goods uh, now on the right-hand side, and also identify the links uh, between the two. And you can also do this across time and see how production, consumption, and their relative impacts have evolved through times. And this is interesting because here you can see, for instance, if you look at the Asia and Pacific uh, region, you can see that they've reduced their production impact between 2001 and 2011. And this is a good thing that because it means that less species are being lost in their region due to land use change uh, for the production of goods. However, in the same period of time, you can also see that the consumption impact of that region has more than doubled. And this means that the region has been exporting its production impact elsewhere. And I can explain, for instance, uh, why the production impact in Central and South America has increased during the same time period. So now back to the key message of the IBES assessment. Indeed, urgent and concerted actions are needed to be taken. Uh, if we want to tackle land degradation, because the drivers, the current drivers are likely to remain and very likely to worsen uh, in the coming years. The final key message uh, of the assessment was that, was that there are 
uh, known and proven actions that can combat land degradation. But the message was also that the more we wait, the more difficult and costly it will be to implement those actions. So the experts called for an urgent change in efforts to implement the actions. More specifically, those actions are improve institutional capacities, policy coordination, intersectorial collaboration and governance, responsible consumption and trade, sustainable land management practices, and of course, the restoration of degraded land. Which brings us to the second part of this talk that will focus now on ecosystem restoration. And I think that this seminar is, uh, is quite timely if we consider that earlier this month, uh, the United Nations followed a recommendation that had been made by uh, El Salvador and declared that the next UN decade, uh, the decade from 2021 to 2030, will be known as the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And this can also be seen as the culmination of many years during which uh, we've seen restoration gaining momentum in the international conservation scene. So for instance, um, throughout the years, there's been increased consideration for restoration in multilateral environmental agreements, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD, or the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. And this has translated into inclusion of restoration within conservation targets, sustainable development goals, or within assessments just as the IPBES assessment that I was discussing earlier. So to illustrate that, uh, I chose to focus on the example that I'm more familiar with, which is IG Target 15 of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And this global conservation target was established in 2010 as part of the CBD IG Biodiversity Target. And it states that by 2020, ecosystem resilience and the contribution of biodiversity to carbon stocks should have been enhanced through conservation and restoration and that this would include uh, the restoration of at least 15% of degraded ecosystems. And one thing that is important to consider is that there's a set of 20 uh, Aichi biodiversity targets, and those targets, they do not work in silo. They interact together, and this means that restoration, um, although it's a very important part of target 15, can also be relevant for other Aichi targets. So concretely, um, when you look at those IG targets, you can consider upstream interaction, and that means that actions taken for other targets will contribute to the achievement of your target of interest. But you can also consider downstream interactions, meaning that actions that are taken to achieve your targets of interest will contribute towards the progress of other targets. So we did this exercise centered around target 15 and using information provided by the CBD on national actions for the IG targets. And what we found interesting is that uh, while the success of target 15 can be supported uh, by progress towards IG target 11, which is the target on protected areas, if you look at the upper part of the figure, uh, we also found that action for IG target 15, including restoration, will contribute to the progress of many of the 20 uh, other IG biodiversity targets, particularly those that are related to ecosystem services, so IG target 14, and a reduction of habitat loss, which is target five. And what this means is that both directly and indirectly, restoration has the potential to contribute to the global biodiversity conservation strategy. Now, unfortunately, uh, when we did the midterm assessment of progress towards the Saichi biodiversity targets back in 2014, the results were not particularly positive when it comes to target 15. Uh, as you can see here, for the first part of the targets, the one that has to do with uh, enhancing ecosystem resilience and carbon stocks through conservation and restoration, we identified that we were sort of following the business as usual trend and that although things were not projected to worsen, uh, they were not projected to improve either. And what illustrated that is that despite important restoration and conservation efforts that were identified globally, we're still observing a net loss in forests, and this is also an important carbon stock. For the second part of the target, uh, that was more specifically on the 15% of degraded ecosystems to be restored uh, by 2020, we assess that progress will be made and that the situation will improve, 
although we're likely to not meet the target by 2020. Um, and the reason is that although there are many restoration activities out there, it's still quite difficult to assess whether they will manage to restore 15% uh, of degraded areas. And still on that note, um, as a follow-up of this assessment that I just uh, presented, there was uh, this publication that looked at the progress across all the IG targets to identify whether globally we were uh, on track um, to achieve those targets. And while you can see that some trends are worsening, uh, others, but not as many, especially when it comes to pressure and state, are predicted to, oh, well, I've been improving. Uh, but unfortunately, at the time, and it's actually still true today, there was no indicator that could be used uh, to assess progress towards IG Target 15. And that being said, um, and despite the fact that the target is not uh, very likely to be achieved, uh, one thing that is quite encouraging and interesting is to see that many countries have designed national targets for restoration. So that's what you can see here uh, on this map. What it shows you is the number of national targets uh, designed by parties of the CBD in their national biodiversity strategies that explicitly address restoration. So in total, uh, there's 54 parties that have designed such targets, uh, some of them having more than one target for restoration. So for example, Bahrain has four targets, China and the UK have three targets, and the other countries that you see identified on these maps will have either two or one target within their biodiversity strategies that are considering explicitly restoration. So there is a need for restoration that is understood globally and nationally, but at the same time, achieving this restoration objective in the next decade uh, is not particularly likely. But maybe we can also see this uh, as an opportunity to consider a bolder approach to conservation and restoration. And this leads me to the third part of this presentation, uh, where I'll be focusing on rewilding. But before doing this, uh, I wanted to um, put our research on rewilding in the, into context and discuss a bit something that we haven't really mentioned until now in this presentation, and that is where restoration can actually be implemented. And indeed, uh, when it comes to rewilding, a lot of the work that I've done uh, can be placed in the context of agricultural abandonment and how this can create new opportunities for restoration. So agricultural land abandonment is not a, a new phenomenon. It started, uh, for instance, in Europe after World War II. And if you look at the histogram at the bottom of the figure, uh, focusing on the gray bars, you can see that it has happened uh, all over the world. It's true it happened less in, uh, in Africa and South America, uh, but it happens everywhere between 1970 and 2000. And what is interesting is that uh, scenarios of land use change for the next decades all project that agricultural abandonment is going to continue uh, with the higher estimates in Europe here, followed by uh, Central and North America. And if you look at the map here on the top, you can see where this abandonment is likely to occur. And to get a better idea of this farmland abandonment, we can zoom into Europe, for instance, uh, now looking at a slightly different set of scenarios. Uh, but we can use those scenarios to identify areas that were classified as agriculture uh, in the 1990s and that are projected to become natural areas following abandonment of agricultural activities uh, by 2030. And the color gradient here uh, is used to reflect the percentage of the cell that is projected to be abandoned. Interestingly, while well, these projections, they are consistent with current observations of rural depopulation and agricultural abandonment, and those mostly affect remote and less productive areas, particularly in mountain range, such as uh, the Pyrenees or the Alps, but they also affect countries that more recently have joined the European Union, such as uh, Romania and Bulgaria. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this agricultural abandonment is actually already happening and it has consequences on the land use and the land cover uh, throughout the, the landscapes. So if we take, for example, this landscapes, this is a picture that's taken in the Italian Alps at the beginning of the 20th century. So you can see that you have a small settlement here surrounded by uh, agricultural fields and a forest that has been pushed uh, towards higher uh, elevations. 
50 years later, uh, the settlement has increased considerably in size, but you can also notice that there is less agricultural fields and that the forest area has expanded. And if you look at the same area uh, 15 years ago, you can see that the forest cover has continuously increased in this area. So clearly there's changing ongoing in the landscape that are driven by the socio-ecological dynamics of farmland abandonment. And this opens uh, new opportunities for restoration, including for restoration using rewilding approaches. So we define rewilding uh, as an approach to restoration that aims at restoring self-sustaining and complex ecosystems with interlinked ecological processes that promote and support each other while minimizing or gradually reducing human intervention. This is our working definition at the moment, but this is not to say that there are no alternative out there, of course. Uh, in fact, the term rewilding was first discussed uh, in the 90s in North America, and at the time put an emphasis on the three C's, core areas, uh, corridors, and carnivores. And in the past years, there are several approaches to rewilding that have been discussed. Uh, so for instance, tropic rewilding is an ecological restoration strategy that uses species introductions in order to restore top-down trophic interactions and associated trophic cascades and the idea is to promote also self-regulating biodiverse ecosystems. Uh, Pleistocene rewilding was suggested in the early 2000s and calls for the restoration of missing ecological functions and evolutionary potential of lost uh, North American megafauna using extant conspecifics or related taxa. And finally, other approaches uh, can suggest more passive approaches to rewilding. Uh, in this case, putting an emphasis on secondary successions and natural recolonization in the context of farmland abandonment. So considering all those different definitions, uh, we've been working on a framework that actually integrate the diversity of rewilding approaches and that also draws uh, on ecological theory. So this framework identifies three interacting ecological processes that promote the self-organization of ecosystems. Dispersal and connectivity, stochastic disturbance, and trophic complexity. So in the framework, in this framework, you can imagine that the red pyramid here is your starting state, which is degraded, and that this yellow pyramid here represents the full restorative restoration potential based on the restoration of those three ecological processes. So the rewilding actions, which are represented here by those arrows, uh, will push your system along those three axes, depending on what is being restored. And the dashed line here represents the societal boundaries uh, that determines to what extent the ecological process can be restored. So those boundaries are, for instance, uh, human wildlife conflicts, or environmental risk that can emerge from um, the restoration of stochastic disturbances and to some, to some extent to dispersal. So the rewilding actions and the inclusion of the social dimension of rewilding can push this, this societal boundaries further towards the optimum for restoration. But to explain this framework a little bit better, I, I picked the um, trophic complexity axis to illustrate a bit um, the, the framework. And clearly, uh, the discussion around the restoration of trophic complexity comes from the observed loss in megafauna worldwide. So this figure here shows you uh, on the right hand side what is the natural megafauna species richness uh, with mega herbivore, large herbivores, and carnivores. And this uh, natural richness refers to what the richness would be in the complete absence of human influence over time. Now on the left hand side, uh, you can see what the actual richness for the same groups is. And it's quite easy to see that most of the fauna is now con uh, constrained uh, to some parts of Africa and South America. And we can also expect that the loss of large herbivores and carnivores had and still has an impact on ecosystems. And indeed, we know that trimming the top levels of traffic networks, which is also known as um, traffic downgrading, has important consequences on other processes within ecosystems. 
So this is what is exemplified here by this figure. Uh, if you look at the top example, this will show you uh, the ecosystem when um, the species is absent and on the right hand side, the ecosystem when the species is present. So the top example uh, is the example of the impact of Arctic foxes, uh, which are known to limit populations of seabirds. And this will in turn limit uh, the nutrient inputs uh, from the sea to the, to the land. And so this, uh, the presence of the Arctic fox will drive the ecosystems going from a grassland to a tundra uh, ecosystem. In the center example, uh, when top predators such as jaguars and cougars are absent, what happens is that the guild of herbivores will increase and that will limit the recruitment uh, and the survival of the vegetation. And finally, uh, a, a quite famous example is the reintroduction of the wolf uh, in the Yellowstone National Park. And it has been observed that it had an impact on the elk populations and in turn, this reduced the browsing pressure and had an impact on the riparian habitat. So there is ecological theory and there is evidence that can support the restoration of trophic complexity as one of the ecological processes uh, in the rewilding framework that I showed you earlier. And concretely, uh, to restore this trophic complexity, there are several approaches that will be needed, and this will depend on what is chosen as a restoration baseline. So for instance, from the Anthropocene to the Pleistocene, and also what is the chosen uh, intensity of the intervention from passive uh, to active. So in cases where the baseline is relatively recent, uh, passive approaches are possible. So in th this part here of the figure, uh, for instance, with uh, natural recolonization, and this has already been observed uh, in France with the expansion of the range of the wolf. Uh, and the wolf until uh, the 60s was actually um, extinct from France and uh, recolonized the country from Italy uh, through the Alps. And this was in part due to uh, legislation that were more favorable to the species, but also to reduce human pressure uh, in its potential habitat. In cases where such natural recolonization is not possible, uh, reintroductions might be needed. And sometimes uh, those reintroductions will have to consider the need for ecological replacements. And this is the case when species are globally extinct and need to be replaced by functional equivalent. And the most extreme form of ecological replacement uh, would be, for instance, the idea of using elephants as a proxy for uh, the megafauna of the Pleistocene. But quite logically, you can also see that the more you advance along those two axes, the more you will increase the ecological uncertainty and the potential for conflict. So now back to the full framework that I presented earlier. One important thing is that within this framework, uh, we identify how the processes can be interacting to promote the self-organization of ecosystems. So if you take, for instance, a landscape that is intensively uh, managed, where you would have, for instance, a pasture, a cropland, and a plantation, um, in this type of landscape, connectivity would have been reduced between the patches because of linear infrastructure. Uh, the traffic complexity is also likely to be reduced because you could have extirpation of large carnivores uh, from the system, for instance. And finally, the regime of disturbance, for instance, flood and fire, uh, might have been suppressed which still leaves room for less frequent, but stronger disturbance events. So this means that the degree to which the ecosystems can recover from a disturbance, uh, which would have, for instance, uh, removed some species from the system is rather low. In comparison, now I'm showing you a restored landscapes where mitigation measures have been, have been put in place to improve connectivity, uh, where we can imagine that hunting has been banned from, uh, banned from certain areas. So uh, the top level of the traffic network uh, are present. Um, and in this case, the regime of disturbance is natural and stochastic. So disturbances represented here by the little uh, lightning bolt can be more fre uh, frequent and impact all the habitats, but they're also less intense. And in this case, the interaction between the restored ecological processes also means that the level of recovery uh, from disturbance will be much higher. Uh, 
Now, if we have another look uh, at this rewilding framework, you'll acknowledge that there is an essential component that uh, is missing, and that is uh, the societal dimension of rewilding. So we also, of course, added this uh, social dimension to the, the framework by mapping to which extent uh, contributions from nature and human well-being would be influenced by rewilding. And in this aspect, we consider uh, non-material contributions from nature, such as cultural and recreational values. Uh, we also consider regulating contribution on, of nature, think of carbon sequestration and soil protection, but also material uh, contributions. And we acknowledge that uh, with rewilding actions, there could be both loss and benefits in terms of those contributions from nature. And indeed, uh, rewilded areas are likely uh, to, to provide a wide range of ecosystem services, although those would be different from other management approaches that might have been used in those areas uh, prior to rewilding. So clearly, uh, food production is only maximized in agricultural areas, uh, and timber production, and to some extent carbon sequestration, will be more important in plantation. But nonetheless, rewilded areas that are here identified with this darker uh, polygon can provide services, particularly uh, regulating and cultural services. And for the later, uh, a good example is the, the potential of rewilded areas to develop business activities oriented towards wildlife, uh, for instance, ecotourism uh, or um, businesses uh, around uh, bird watching. That being said, uh, it's also crucial to consider uh, the potential negative social impact of an increase in wildlife, uh, for instance, human wildlife conflicts that would result from uh, the depredation on livestock and damages that can be done to fields. So this is uh, uh, what this picture here illustrates is rooting uh, that is done by uh, wild boars. And this is particularly intense in places such as Europe, uh, where we're we're witnessing a comeback of species that have been extinct sometimes for centuries. And this has to some extent led to a shifting people's baselines when it comes to understanding and perceiving what is natural and what wildlife is. So in Europe, there's some work to, to do with uh, the perception of wildlife and the impact that it can have on local populations. I can suspect that this is uh, possibly the case uh, in other regions. But fortunately, uh, those conflicts can be addressed uh, by using several approaches, which of course are non mutually exclusive. So um, what's useful is to implement some mitigation measures, for instance, the, the building of fences. Um, another approach is uh, to use compensation schemes. Uh, this is already done in some countries uh, when livestock is lost due to predation by uh, wild animals. However, if we really want to limit those conflicts, I think one, one thing that's been identified as key is to work on the education and the information of the public. Um, because mitigation and compensation on their own, they are not likely to provide long-term solution uh, to those conflicts. So education and information uh, are quite crucial. Now, I wanted to give you a couple of uh, concrete examples uh, using this rewilding uh, framework. So I'll, I'll give you three examples, and every time we've represented the framework. So uh, orange would mean the, the, the state of the system at the, the beginning of the restoration project, uh, and the, or the yellow uh, pyramid would represent the current state. And on the right-hand side, you will have the um, losses and benefits of uh, nature's contribution to people. So the first example that I chose uh, is the Swiss National Park uh, and its non-intervention policy. Uh, and this policy has been applied there since the creation of the park at the beginning of uh, the 20th century. So the management has been strict non-management uh, and the park is banning, for instance, human activities such as hunting, forestry uh, or agriculture. There's been throughout the years some targeted reintroductions uh, in order to restore trophic complexity. Uh, this was the case with the ibex and the bearded vultures. And the natural disturbance, the stochastic disturbance, are also not uh, being managed. So they were already uh, in a pretty good state to begin with. So 
There has been some conflicts with local populations, but they've been mitigated by targeted measures. Uh, so for instance, uh, there was some conflicts because uh, red deers were causing damage uh, to the to the area and then some hunting events were organized outside of the border uh, of the park to mitigate uh, the, these conflicts. So what's interesting is that uh, nowadays species that were uh, nearly extinct in Switzerland, they have a quite large population in the park. So we're talking about roe deer, for instance, ibex, uh, chamois. Um, and there's also been an increase in the population of red deer which led to a higher uh, plant richness uh, in the subalpine grasslands. And more recently, wolves and brown bears have been sighted, so there could be an imminent recolonization uh, by large carnivores in those areas. And on the human side, uh, this park attracts about 150,000 visitors per year, and so it contributes quite substantially uh, to the economy of the region. My second example uh, is the Tijuca National Park in the city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, so as you probably know, the Atlantic forest of Brazil is a biodiversity hotspot, but most of its remnants have been defonated. And the Tijuca National Park is one of, uh, of those remnants of the Atlantic uh, forest. So deforestation and hunting pressure had led to important loss of uh, the native fauna there and because it's surrounded by urban infrastructure there was not much room for natural recolonization so there was a project that was established in 2012 uh, the refauna project um, that was started to restore uh, the mammal community uh, using reintroduction and in this case the reintroduction of the red humped agouti which is an important uh, seed disperser and the reintroduction of howler monkeys that are known to influence uh, dung beetle abundance, but also uh, with their dung to influence uh, nutrient cycling and soil fertilization, fertilization. So what monitoring has revealed is that there were positive uh, outcomes of those introductions with improved dispersal uh, and germination success of several large seeded plant species and overall a positive impact on forest generation. On the human side, uh, there's still little emotional connection uh, between the people that live in the vicinity of the area and the park itself. But this is being addressed at the moment. So there's been the establishment uh, of a community-based cooperative project where locals are trained as tourist guides and there's also a restaurant that was created and that offers uh, products of local cuisine that are prepared with products from the forest and from the community garden. So there's ongoing efforts to reconnect uh, the the community, the human community with the, with the park. And finally, my last example uh, is the Chernobyl exclusion zone um, in, uh, in Ukraine and, uh, and Belarus. So as you may know, uh, the meltdown of the nuclear reactor in Chernobyl in um, April of 1988 led to some massive contamination of the site uh, and of its surrounding. So the local population was, uh, was evacuated within um, about 30 kilometer wide exclusion zone. And this has resulted in the abandonment uh, of the surroundings uh, and of about 1,400 uh, square kilometers of agricultural land. In the years that followed uh, the nuclear meltdown, uh, the breakdown of the Soviet Union and the resulting outmigrations also led to an additional abandonment of more than a third of the farmland in both Belarus and Ukraine. And that also then further lowered the human pressure in the entire region. So two years after the meltdown, uh, part of the site was converted into what was called the Polizi State Radio Ecological Reserve. Um, and the size of these protected areas has been increasing uh, since. The management that's been put in place uh, follows minimum to no intervention, but there has been some reintroduction in the areas of uh, European bisons and Przewalski's horses. So today the region is home to an entire range, uh, to the entire range of extant species of large carnivores and herbivores in Europe, as well as mesopredators such as the, barger, the badger and the fox, uh, and ecosystem engineers such as the European beaver. So today, this uh, Chernobyl exclusion zone can be seen as one of the most iconic 
although unwanted, natural experiments uh, on rewilding in uh, recent history. So now that I give you uh, those examples, you might wonder how rewilding progress can be measured uh, in the different areas that are being restored. And to answer this question, the, there was an approach that was developed by my colleagues, and the idea was to calculate uh, a rewilding score to measure the progress towards rewilding and towards its outcome. So what they did is to define a bidimensional space for measuring uh, rewilding progress. So you measure the progress by uh, decreasing human forcing of natural processes, so decreasing direct human inputs and outputs of materials into the system, uh, for instance, timber production, and by uh, restoring the ecological integrity of the ecosystems. So on the left, you see a conceptual illustration of where um, areas that are associated with common land use might appear in this bidimensional space. So for instance, uh, industrial agriculture here with high level of human forcing on the ecosystem and low ecological integrity, and pristine areas here which have high uh, ecological integrity and low uh, human forcing. And what you can see here on the right-hand side, um, uh, shows you as the, how the position of a given uh, site or uh, rewilding areas can change as a result of uh, restoration actions. And so to illustrate and test uh, this framework, they applied it to three flagship restoration projects in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, and in Argentina. And those areas of very different uh, characteristics as you can imagine. So they contacted the managers in those parks and they asked them uh, for information and data on a set of indicators uh, that they had previously identified as relevant to characterize either the human forcing of ecosystems or its ecological integrity. And so these indicators are shown here uh, on this figure uh, and it shows you the results at each site um at the start of the project so in gray and at the um at present uh time so this is uh in uh, dark gray here so the indicators on the top they will correspond to the pressure variable so that's what we want to minimize to increase the rewilding score and at the bottom you can see the indicators that refer to the state variable uh, of ecological integrity and this is what we want to increase in order to increase the rewilding score so it's, it's interesting uh, to note that there were some general trends across the three uh, sites and the three restoration contexts. So if you look at the bottom here, uh, species richness and viability of populations of large animals have systematically increased uh, since the beginning of the project. And this is consistent with uh, successful programs of active reintroductions and also spontaneous recolonization of species across the different sites. Um, another common trend is that uh, production and extractive activities such as um, the management of farmland or grasslands or even mining have either decreased or remained stable uh, across all sites. And so once you have all this information for all the sites and across all the indicators, uh, you can calculate the rewilding score both at the start of the project uh, and at current time. And here you can see that um, there was a general reduction uh, of human forcing of ecosystems and improvement in ecological integrity uh, that translates into an overall increase of this rewilding score across all sites. And what was interesting also in this study is that they showed that in general, the framework seems to be applicable to measure rewilding progress across very different uh, contexts from the Netherlands to the, the Swiss National Park and to the, the, the Argentinian case. And I wanted to, to conclude this presentation by connecting rewilding with uh, policy making and very briefly mention what is going on in the European Union at the moment. So a couple of years ago, uh, the Rewilding Europe Foundation, together re with uh, researchers from the University of Oxford, uh, wrote a policy brief that was arguing for rewilding and suggesting that the EU should develop an enabling policy environment uh, for rewilding. And this is particularly relevant when we consider the restoration targets for Europe and the development of what is called this uh, blue and green infrastructure. 
In this context, there was a project that was started uh, that is titled Promoting and Shaping the EU Restoration Agenda Through Mobilization of Rewilding Principles. Um, and what is interesting about this project is that it brings together scientists, practitioners, NGOs, and decision makers. And the rewilding score that I just mentioned to you is one of the first deliverable of this project. So what they're doing now is discussing how to integrate the socio-ecological dynamics of rewilding into this, uh, this scoring process. Uh, and other participants are also looking into uh, the mapping of the rewilding potential uh, in Europe. So to finish, uh, I'll bring you almost back to where we started. Um, and I wanted to say that if we consider on the one hand the, the momentum that restoration has been gaining in the last decade, and on the other hand, the scientific knowledge that supported the conceptualization of rewilding as a restoration approach, I hope that this UN decade for ecosystem restoration will also lead the way for bold and flexible approaches to conservation and restoration, one of them being rewilding. And with that, uh, I wanted to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leticia, for a wonderful presentation. We have uh, several questions from the audience. I'll read them to you so you could uh, so you could answer them. So the first question is from Chadia. Do you think more ambitious targets for restoration will be discussed in the new biodiversity targets now? Well, I, I think so, and this is uh, part of the, the process that is ongoing at the moment. So I don't know if you're aware, but uh, the, um, the the CBD is going to um, um, is, it started already the process of uh, designing its new uh, biodiversity framework. So um, stakeholders have been invited to uh, contribute to the discussion on this uh, on this framework that would start in uh, 2021. Um, and I know, for instance, that my colleagues that are involved in this uh, in this project uh, with the Rewilding Europe Foundation are, have been discussing also at the level of the European Commission on how uh, bolder approaches such as rewilding could be considered uh, in this, uh, this strategy uh, for the post-2020 uh, uh, conservation agenda. So I, I, I think this is the discussion that is ongoing at the moment. Uh, and what is interesting is that we have also the evidence that can support, uh, to some extent, those, uh, those new approaches. Thank you, Leticia. Another question, which methodology, um, which methodology used to estimate contribution of biodiversity carbon stocks and ecosystem resilience? Please, if you could please share. Um, are you referring to the rewilding score or to the in general, the contribution of uh, nature uh, to people? Or this was not specified in the question, I guess. It was not, but um, right. if the person as that asked the people... work, So as far as the work that uh, I've been involved in, we didn't do this assessment directly, so it was mostly based on, the, on literature reviews of studies that have been done uh, on different sites. Um, I do not know if this was done in the rewilding score. I could have a quick look, but I don't think this is the case. Uh, but there they also uh, contacted di directly uh, managers of the areas to ask them. So thank you. I think my, my best answer is uh, th this, this was based on literature reviews. Perfect. Thank you. Which uh, another question uh, is with so much agricultural land being abandoned globally, where will food for humans be produced? Yeah, that's that's a really good um, that's a really good question. So, what what I hear oftentimes when I when I uh, present um, the trends in farmland abandonment and um, and the potential for rewilding is some concern that there might be uh, some displacement of uh, of the impact of agriculture. Um, on land uses and say if agriculture is abandoned, uh, for instance, in Europe, that means the damage will be done elsewhere, which is a bit the idea of, of this, uh, this um, work that I showed you at the beginning that was showing um, bird extinction resulting from uh, global trade. However, 
in the particular case uh, of Europe, the land is being a, the land that is being abandoned is not that productive. It's land that's quite remote. Uh, it has uh, lower productivity when you compare it to other areas, um, and it, it's particularly uh, land that you found in mountainous areas. So abandoning this land doesn't necessarily mean uh, that food production overall is uh, going to decrease uh, substantially. But it is for sure something uh, that we should uh, keep in mind and, and, and start looking at also um, how this, like if abandonment occurs, then where is there any leakage uh, of, uh, of impact? And if so, where? Hello. Leticia, we have another question. Mm -hmm. It seems that the question is, it seems that the narrative or framework on rewilding focuses primarily on biological processes and interactions. Why does it appear to ignore geomorphological processes such as levels of soil erosion and landscape incision, which affects hydrological regime? This is particularly relevant in arid and semi-arid environments. So that, that's also a good question. Um, so we have been choosing those uh, those three particular uh, axes within our framework because we considered that they were the ones uh, that were the most relevant for the restoration of self-sustaining ecosystems. But this is not to say that more generally for restoration, other uh, dimensions are not relevant. Um, but I have to say that this is not something that I have considered until then, so I'll make a note and look into it uh, for later. So thank you also for this comment. Thank you, Leticia. Um, does, does rewilding approach for restoration can work in Africa? That's a question. Yeah, for, uh, I think so. There, there's, no, um, there's no reason. So it's true that most of the examples that we'll, you will see uh, will tend to come from Europe or maybe North America. And I think this has to do also with uh, maybe a higher availability of land in, uh, resulting from um, from the trends in farmland abandonment. But that is not to say that these are the only place where this is uh, applicable. And in fact, um, when we look for examples to apply this framework, we also found an example um, in um, in, in other regions of the world, such as the example uh, in uh, in Brazil, uh, as well as for the study on the, the rewilding score, there was some, um, uh, one of the case studies was, uh, was a park or a site in uh, Argentina. So in theory, I don't know why this would not be possible uh, in Africa. There's no reason, I would say. Perfect. Another question. Do we need reference ecosystem information for rewilding? How would you decide which species can be introduced if no reference is available? Yes, that, that's a good question. Um, in, in relation to that, I want to, to emphasize that the, the, the re part of rewilding does not necessarily mean that we want to go back to a predetermined state. So having an historical baseline is very useful, uh, but not as a target, more as a guideline. Um, so depending on for how long there's been uh, degradation of your landscape, this, this historical reference might be set further in time. And it's true that in some cases, um, we have very little information uh, on this best line. But what we want also, and it's true that it didn't really um, elaborate on this, is to set up a uh, stepwise process that is flexible so we can reassess uh, the direction um, in which the, the, the system is going and, and possibly adjust uh, some of the management and interventions along the way. Um, so you could think of it as, a, as an iterative process uh, that also involves the uh, a local population, so they can also be involved in uh, in in the the process of uh, of rewilding. Perfect. There is another question, actually, comment from an attendee. Um, it's about um, we have this issue around Yellowstone in the reintroduction of wolves. 
Has this had any effect on endangered species in the European Union? Mm, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure I heard the beginning. Sure. Um, so the, the, the person is talking about the issue of uh, reintroducing, reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone, mm -hmm. as an example. And she's asking if, uh, you know, if this has had an effect on endangered species in the European Union. Right. So, so that we would have, for instance, a top carnivore uh, coming back and then negatively impacting some um, a population of prey that would be endangered. Um, there's no example that comes to mind, but it's true that um, there might always be some winners and losers uh, species with those uh, restoration approach. So not specifically in the case of reintroduction of, uh, for instance, uh, large carnivores, but more with the, the, the idea of um, farmland abandonment. There's quite a lot of concern in Europe that uh, we would lose uh, open habitats, so for instance, grasslands, uh, where we have a, a high diversity of species that until now have, are, are highly dependent on human management to maintain those habitats uh, open. Uh, but in reality, this is also why we are considering this this framework with three axes, it's not just about uh, restoring one of those axes. And if you have, for instance, in the case of abandoned farmland, the reintroduction of browsers and grazers, then you have the potential to maintain those habitats. But you also want those species uh, to, to not overgraze, so you will need uh, to restore the trophic complexity so that you could have control of those population of grazers and browsers. So this is why we're... Um, promoting this approach is that considers different uh, processes. Um, and I realize that I'm not sure that I answered uh, the original question, but there is no particular example that comes to mind. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. it's a, Thank you. Thank yeah. you. There is another question that I have. What tools, software protocols, evaluation metrics are available for practitioners that you could um, recommend? So, um, some tools, for instance, this uh, publication on the, the rewilding score is already uh, has been published and they detail pretty well uh, how, uh, which are the different indicators that they chose and what was the method to calculate them. So I think this could be useful, for instance, uh, for uh, practitioners. And then there's a lot of work that is being done uh, also by uh, practitioners. So, for instance, if you take this uh, Rewilding Europe Foundation, they have several sites in Europe where they've been promoting rewilding and they have some uh, material that they make available through their website, I'm, I'm sure, uh, to, to help practitioners that we want to apply those uh, rewilding principles. Um, I There is my email here, um, and I'm sure that I won't be able to answer all of your questions, so please feel free to uh, drop me an email and I'd be happy to uh, provide you with more information or put you in contact with the right persons if, uh, if needed. Thank you, Leticia. And we, have, um, we are conscious of the time. We have one last question. How to use this framework at a highly populated area? Another good question. So we are, um, again, when we thought of this framework, uh, the, the scale was actually always um, in the back of our mind. And that's also why uh, we have uh, looked into it in the, in the case of the uh, uh, protected area in Brazil. We're, we're talking about a protected area uh, in Rio de Janeiro, so a pretty uh, urbanized place. And so this framework, is uh, applicable as well. One limitation is, I will go back to the framework, is that being in such a uh, urban uh, and densely populated areas will probably limit the extent to which uh, this um, societal boundaries can move. So this, this triangle that is represented by the dash line here might be a little smaller, might take longer, to actually uh, make it larger if even possible. So the, 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 the framework can be applied, but the extent to which it can be applied and the extent to which uh, all the processes can be uh, restored will vary depending on the scale and, uh, and the area and the context. 
Thank you so much, Leticia. Thank you. We have a couple more questions, but um, we ran out of time. We'll pass I those will questions. I want my email again here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you again, Leticia, for a wonderful, wonderful and very enlightening presentation on this um, uh, initiative, Ecosystem Restoration, Global Initiatives in Science and Practice, organized by the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group of the IUCN Commission of Ecosystem Management and Pulse of the Planet. Thank you so much, Leticia. Thank you again, uh, Miguel, for the invitation. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. And apologies again for the technical difficulties at the beginning. And I'm looking forward to more questions if you have uh, via email. Please don't hesitate uh, to contact me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And we will now um, uh, stop the webinar. Thank you so much for all the attendees.